Welcome to A Window on Samri, where we take you inside South Australia's independent not-for-profit health and medical research institute. Each episode, we get to know the people driving our life-changing research, getting into what motivates them personally and how their work is delivering a brighter, healthier future for all. Alice, when did you first develop an interest in science? Well, my first research experience was really when I became an honours student, where I got to do a, a research project based out of the Women's and Children's Hospital. And that, for me, that was the first year where I was completely responsible for, you know, designing a project, running it, getting results and writing it up. And that was just a great experience. It was like a, almost like a kind of freeing experience. And I really enjoyed that. And then from there, went on to do a PhD and and that was really the start of my academic career. What did you feel at the end of that? I think a real set, sense of um, satisfaction that we'd answered an, an important question and then where I, I was able to get it published in several journals, which was for me you know, a real highlight as a, I think I was probably 21 year old student at the time and, and see it get out there and get some attention was really fulfilling and satisfying. And also presenting it to kind of clinical collaborators and colleagues and realising that this was an important topic for people working clinically in the area of, it was obstetrics at the time. What about when you were a kid, were you sciencey? I guess so, but I mean, I really enjoyed the the typical science subjects like maths and chemistry and physics and biology as well. But I was also really into kind of more creative topics too, like really into music as a kid. And I think that really sort of the combination of music and maths really kind of helped shape my brain in terms of thinking about the work that I do now and being really precise. And, you know, I'm still a bit of a maths nerd. I love I love my numbers and data. So that probably stemmed from when I was a kid as well. So always a problem solver. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And what took you down the path of becoming a researcher? Well, as I said, the you know having that first experience um, doing honours and and running a project, completing it myself, and the satisfaction of having a project that actually meant something and produced some really interesting evidence was the kind of first spark. And then I I went on to do a PhD, and then I realised that perhaps I needed a bit more experience in the world. So I, I took some time off and did a master's of public health. And then I moved up to Darwin for something kind of really completely different and um, was involved in lots of research project, projects up in Darwin with remote communities. And just having that kind of diversity of working in a hospital and then working in the community and then working in really remote communities was really enjoyable. What did that do for your perspective? Oh, it's great. I mean, it's, it's very humbling. And you realise that people live, you know, in very different ways and have very different opportunities and experiences. And equally, I got to see some really beautiful remote parts of the country, which probably not many Australians have been able to see. So that kind of combination of all those things kind of is quite awe-inspiring. What made you want to go out there? Wanting to see the world, but I think just this realisation that there are a lot of challenges in our own country that deserve attention and that people living in remote communities have really different life opportunities, but also, you know, such amazing, strong culture and and seeing culture being strong and, and flowing in these communities in the context of having a lot of, you know, health challenges and social challenges was really interesting do you feel like you made a connection with that culture or it had an impact on you that's lasted? Yeah, definitely. I think we're so lucky to live in a country where, you know, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are the longest surviving living culture. I mean, what a unique experience for us to have as Australians. And I think, you know, that recognition that I was able to, to be a part of some of those cultures, even for a short time, um, has left a really lasting impression and would you say you've continued to be an adventurer or was that, was that it, the trip to the NT and then back again? Oh, no, I, I, absolutely. Like, I love the travel aspects of the job. When I got back from Darwin, I had children and that sort of limits your travel a little bit for a while. But um, I just love getting out there and um, being out in the communities. And, you know, we get to travel with our job in terms of conferences and that's always fun. But, I, you know, I love a good road trip to go and collect some data as well. Got the playlist. <laughs> yep. Where did the focus on pregnancy health come from? I think I've always been really kind of in awe at the human body um, and that perhaps that stemmed from when I was a child, but really what the human body is capable of, particularly this ability to grow an entirely new human life. And it's such a common 
everyday experience, but there is so much information and so much that we still don't know about and so many challenges to address, you know, in the pregnancy and early life space. Is that something you've always been captivated by? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so how is your own experience of having children factored into the work you do and the way you think about your research? Yeah, I think the it, it's very humbling. You realise that families that participate in our clinical trials, particularly with young kids, are really making such a, are being really generous with their time and making such an effort to give us data. And when you have your own children, you realise how kind of often hectic and chaotic a family life can be, particularly in those very early years. It's made me really reflect on, you know, making sure we collect the best possible data, but have the most kind of minimal uh, impact on family and, and perhaps burden on family's time. And when you were going through being pregnant, did you feel like there were things that needed to be improved that came up then that are, that you've thought about since? or I guess in some ways the, there's a lot of routine things that happen in pregnancy and then we, when you ask why, um, sometimes the response is, you know, like routine tests and investigations, the response might be, well, because we've always done it. I think the field has massively advanced in terms of generating evidence and having guidelines around clinical interventions in pregnancy. So that's uh, definitely been a, an important advance. But I think that, you know, you definitely, as you experience these things, you start to kind of question, well, you know, what can I do more? And um, sometimes the answer is we don't know. And that's always a, a source of inspiration for research. And equally, you know, when my children were young as babies, it, you know, it's really challenging, particularly learning skills like breastfeeding, and that's really informed a lot of the breastfeeding research that I do now. How much do you feel like you've seen that bench to bedside translation? I guess I have a unique experience in knowing the amount of effort and work that goes into research to then be translated. Um, so I, I think I'm probably lucky to, to realise that there's a huge amount of work and ideas and inspiration that goes behind the way that we care for women in pregnancy and also afterwards. And we're really lucky in a country like Australia to have those resources available to us. And seeing things now like the Omega-3 program and the GIF trial, to name a few, what's that like for you after, you, like you said, after a, a lot of work to see it manifesting in a big time way? Yeah, it's really personally fulfilling because you realise that we are addressing questions that are important to women and families. And, you know, I saw that um, myself having had that experience of having children and, and realising that we can actually make a real difference with our, our research. And we're really lucky in the research that we do to have really strong collaborations with clinicians that are working uh, in the pregnancy and, and newborn space. And having those ongoing collaborations really majorly advances the, our ability to translate our findings quickly. Do you get to spend much time meeting mums and little kids? Not so much anymore. And we have a fabulous team at Summary Women's and Kids that are really on the front line of collecting data and working with families. So I don't get to see them as much anymore, but I'd, I'd love to get a bit more time if I could carve that out. So you used to love that? Yep, absolutely. And it's that personal connection with families. And I think, you know, in a lot of the trials we do because we follow these families up from often pregnancy right and through right through until their children can be school age and seeing, you know, you're a very small part of that family's lives in some ways as well because you're seeing their children grow. Nothing could be more special than that. Oh, absolutely. So you've risen to the point now where you're a theme leader. How does mentoring the next generation of up and coming scientists factor into your role? It's a really important part of the work that I do and something that I'd really like to grow even more. Uh, I think the it, it's working in academia, particularly medical research, is incredibly cutthroat and very competitive and can be really hard to survive, particularly when you first finish your research training, whether that be a PhD or a, a research master's. But also helping people find their path, often you know, the, the work that you do as part of your PhD may not be the research area that you focus on after, after your PhD, and that's okay. So helping early and mid-career researchers kind of navigate that pathway of hyper-competitiveness, but also you know, following a passion that you're wanting to explore is, is really important. But it's also what I really enjoy about the job too, again, getting back to that personal connection, whether it be with families or with uh, our team members or early career researchers. Do you remember feeling that pressure at that point in your career? 
Absolutely. And I think we all feel it now. Um, the pressure doesn't ease up. I think you just get better at probably dealing with it. But certainly when you finish your PhD, particularly those first couple of years post PhD, when you're trying to get funding, trying to you know get as many publications and outputs as you can to build your track record can be really challenging and, and tough. How do you support those younger researchers who are trying to build that career? I think the key thing is being part of a, a big team. So having the opportunity for early career researchers to be involved in projects that they're not necessarily leading, but can contribute in a meaningful way that can help build their, their track record in terms of publications and helping to guide them into knowing, you know, what's, there are a lot of kind of good opportunities that come up. Sometimes they can be really time consuming, sometimes they, they're not. So helping um, early career researchers navigate what's a good opportunity to take, you know, take hold of now versus what's something that could be an opportunity cost and, you know, potentially damaging to, to building that track record and helping them recognise that there are very few opportunities that never come around again. We kind of think, uh, we all get excited by shiny things and kind of want to go off in these new directions, but sometimes it's really just about consolidating and focusing to to kind of get your track record going at the time. What sort of opportunities are they? Could be running conferences. It could be supervising other students. It could be uh, reviewing grants or reviewing publications or being on a, a potentially being on a committee for a professional society. So helping students kind of and NECRs pick and choose what's the best opportunity for them at the time that's going to be you know contribute to building their track record or fill a fill a gap in the CV. Uh, versus, you know, you've already done that, you've ticked that box, perhaps you don't need to focus so much on, you know, doing a grant review or a paper review at the expense of doing something else that might be better for building your CV. So trying to implement that strategic thinking. That's right, on, yeah. And think of it tactically rather than just doing the same thing every time and expecting a different result or building up one area but then being lacking in others. Yeah, that's right, because we've all got limited time. Academia can bleed into your personal life a lot and so managing that as an early career researcher is really important. And, you know, I guess if you want to do take up every opportunity you can, but um, it is also important to have a life outside of academia. So having that kind of early strategic thinking can be really helpful to to kind of go, yeah, look, you know, perhaps you don't need to focus so much on that now. You've, you've already kind of ticked that box, as I said. And on that, how do you manage to have a life outside of science? <laughs> I think it's hard. It's a constant challenge. Uh, you know, we're not all good at it. Um, for me, having a family and, and kids is really grounding. It means, you know, I, I can't, literally can't spend every weekend doing papers and grants. Did and you used to? A little bit, yeah, yeah. But also not just about having kids, but having a lot of friends that are outside of academia that really keep you grounded and real and you realise that, you know, sometimes the problems that we face in academia are pretty far removed from, you know, everyday experiences and we're pretty lucky to have those challenges. So having friends that kind of ground you are also really important as well. How's your ability to be able to switch off developed over the years? I'd say it's a work in progress, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we, you know, you just get better at um, being able to do that, whether that means, you know, physically not looking at emails or being really setting really clear boundaries with what you are going to do and, and not going to do with your time. That's probably very generic responses, but as I said, it's a bit of a work in progress, but we're all trying. How are you different at work compared to home? I think if you ask my children, they wouldn't have much of an idea what a professor does. Uh, they probably, you know, when I uh, was promoted to professor, I think they were thinking it'd be something like Harry Potter kind of style. They were disappointed. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't come with any magical powers. <laughs> no spells. Yeah. Although they're probably happy with that. But You're pretty close, though, with some of the things that you guys come up with. Pretty oh, close to magicians, I think. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a nice way to... Put it. I think it comes back to like we do try and solve big problems and challenging issues, um, which you, you need a bit of creative thinking and perhaps a bit of magic to solve those. But I don't think that's particularly appealing to my kids. <laughs> I think they'd rather I had, you know, some kind of Dumbledore's powers or something. Do you switch into a, a level of focus at work that you don't have in the rest of your life, or do you have like a, a switch that you flip, or do you feel like you're pretty consistent across everything? No, I'd say I'd, I'd, I think you come into work with a much greater level of focus and that's learned. I think that's hard to, to kind of just do that, you know, straight away from finishing uni. So you do learn how to become focused. I guess at home, some of the things which I 
really enjoy, which helped me switch off. Of, like music is a really big part of my life, and so that really helps switch off whether playing that, music everything. So I love listening to, I love seeing live music and playing music as well. And I think the you know when you are playing music in particular, that can be. You know, you're so focused on being able to do that that that's Can't actually think really of anything good. Else. Yeah, that's right. So that's how you go and get some space. Yeah, that's right. What do you play? So I play piano and cello. Wow. And has that been a lifelong thing? Yeah. So I was really lucky as a kid to learn have the opportunity to learn lots of different instruments, but I kind of settled on um, those two and have been able to take that with me through lots of different parts of my life. So when I lived in Darwin, I was part of the Darwin Symphony Orchestra, which was just a great way to meet people and have fun. But I'm not just... Are you part of anything at the moment? I'm not, no. So it gets back to the... um, Would you like to be? Oh, probably when my kids are a bit older. Probably get back into it and not necessarily classical music. I'm probably more not into that kind of music as much anymore. What about the Sam Rhee Band? Oh, look, if there's, an, if there's a space I'm going. I'm sure they'd love to have you. You mean Estronia of Sound? <laughs> might need some... They, they need a penis. Well, no, it's, might need some singing lessons then too. <laughs> <laughs> I think Pete's got that covered. So you're playing that regularly? Not as regularly as I would like. Probably, you know, just play piano more because it's sitting there and I hear my kids play and, you know, sometimes we'll go and join them afterwards. But, yeah, it's a really good um, strategy for me. It kind of gives you both energy and joy, but also a sense of calm. And so is there orchestral tones coming from the lab? No, no. No, it's all dead silent. (laughs) No, I mean, I hope there's, you know, a reasonable amount of kind of laughter and chatter because it's all about, you know, we've got a great team. It's not all about being serious all Mm. the time. How do you foster that fun element of it and create a culture that people want to be a part of, given it is cutthroat, it is really intense you're working long long hours, often being frustrated by grant results or things not happening as fast as you'd like them to happen. So how do you keep the vibes up? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we do that in a number of ways. The first, One of the things we're really good at is we celebrate our successes and it's really important as part of celebrating those successes that we acknowledge that the success comes from a contribution of a large number of individuals, including other academics, but including our research team that are the ones that are driving, you know, that data collection and evidence generation that helps us get a new paper or um, a new grant. So celebrating those successes with the team, having some team building activities too is is critical and and making sure that we are really committed to connecting the team, particularly if there are any kind of challenges or disputes that come up, we try and deal with those, you know, quite quickly. Uh, and then get back to kind of, you know, how do you foster and build team connectedness through, you know, that might be sort of mentoring, getting some people, some mentoring activities happening between early and mid-career researchers and equally between perhaps more of our junior research support team and a senior support team member. How big has mentoring been for you? It's been essential for me in terms of developing a, a long and fulfilling and productive research career. I've been really lucky to have a couple of really senior female academics who've guided me and and really helped me overcome a lot of challenges. Um, And I still reach out to them today, probably not as much as I I used to, but just having a a trusted independent source to kind of help you navigate challenges and and give you, you know, perhaps strategic advice uh, has been really important. So you never get too big for that? I don't think so, no. I suppose if you always have that willingness to learn, then that's going to ensure that you continue to develop and not feel like you're doing it alone. Yeah, I think that's what makes us good researchers and scientists, that we are inherently curious and and really like learning new things. And that doesn't change across the course of your career. I think as long as you have that commitment, I think you're always going to be a a good academic and learning that from new people, um, whether that be your, you know, junior team members. I think we learn a lot from our teams as well as people above us who've who've achieved uh, a lot as well. What have you seen change in regard to women in STEM during your career? I think there's a lot more recognition that there are systemic barriers to women advancing in um, health and medical research in particular. But equally, there's been a lot more attention focused on addressing those barriers. We've still got a little way to go, but it's really changed from, you know, having this recognition that, you know, when women do take time out 
for having children, for example, that that can be that can impact you not just in you know the six to twelve months that you might sort of take as maternity leave, but actually the opportunities that you miss out on during those times can have lasting impacts on your career trajectory and, and track record. So trying to take account of those and your ability to travel overseas and all the kind of traditional metrics that we get assessed, I think it is changing um, and that's really pleasing to see. And it seems like there are more women in STEM. Definitely. I mean, I can only speak to health and medical research where we know the vast majority of graduates uh, working in sort of health and medical research are, are women. But we know from the kind of a lot of the graphs that say our funding bodies like NHMRC um, put up, as we progress through the kind of ranks of academia, that the number of women progressing to those higher levels becomes a lot less. Um, so that is a, as I said, that is an ongoing issue. I think we are getting better at addressing that, but still got a long way to go. What do you think it is? Um, it's probably complicated, but why is there that drop off before women get to be professors? It's a number of factors, but I guess, you know, a lot of, a lot of women do take time out for um, having families and child rearing and the impact that that can have on your, you know, competitiveness in terms of the way that, say, NHMRC assesses your competitiveness can be really great. As I said, it could be the fact that you don't get invited to be on grants um, because you can't contribute time. It could be that your you know, publication record drops off, but also you don't have the ability to travel so much uh, potentially to those overseas conferences where you get sort of important presentations and, and recognition um, internationally, which are seen to be important aspects of your track record. Have you really seen that factor into people's decision making around having children? So not in my own sphere. I think, uh, you know, in terms of the people that I collaborate with, most people seem to just try and make it work. I'm, I'm not aware of people that are deliberately avoiding having a family, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was happening. The other thing which I think is really important to recognise is that women actually sometimes have different leadership styles. Um, sometimes it can be more sort of leading from behind. And I don't think we yet kind of progress to recognise those different leadership styles in the way that we assess track records at the moment. What's your leadership style? Do you, does, come, does being a leader come naturally to you? I think I like being surrounded by a team and so perhaps um, you know more characterised by leading from behind. But I'm really interested in promoting the careers of sort of junior and early mid-career researchers so I'd like to say I'm the kind of leader that wants to bring a team along with them and, and really promote um, as many of our sort of early career researchers as possible. And yeah, does it come naturally? Have you felt like you were ready to take, take that mantle or is it something that's gradually happened over time or you've always been someone that was keen to nurture others? I think I've always been keen to nurture other researchers, but I think leadership skills you do learn over time and... Um, you learn them from sort of cutting your teeth in your first project to then, you know, doing a much larger project, supervising other team members, building a team, and then sort of getting up to building a, you know, a program of research with often with many teams. So I, for me, I think it's something that I've learnt over time, not something that probably comes naturally. And so that's, you know, I think building that confidence is something that we need to do with a lot of our researchers because, you know, the best ideas come from people with, you know, a diverse range of leadership skills. What would little Alice think about where you're at now? I think she'd be proud and excited at the prospect of, of doing some really important work that's helping improve outcomes for, for women and babies. How much do you feel a sense of progress in that area? I think the progress is huge and I feel lucky that I've had the opportunity to work in lots of different aspects of, of uh, pregnancy and early childhood research. And I think we've really come a long way, particularly in the research that we do with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, that recognition that we have to do things differently and that there is so much to learn from the way that you research with communities um, and how that that in itself, um, the processes that you do in terms of supporting Aboriginal researchers to lead that research produces the best outcomes. And where do you want to take women and kids at Samri? Look, I think we will continue our kind of strengths in terms of the areas that we're really strong at in, in terms of nutrition, but also broaden and, and Aboriginal families, supporting 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and families in that early years. But I think we will also broaden out um, the research that we do to look at what are the kind of key challenges in the reproductive lifespan, including, you know, how do you best support families or couples uh, to making decisions about when and where to have children and also uh, look at the kind of common challenges that we face postnatally after for families, particularly, you know, continuing our research around breastfeeding and, and the best ways to support the neurodevelopment of, of children. We've done lots of amazing work so far and sounds like there's lots more to do. There always is, yeah. It's great to have you at the helm, though. I'm sure the theme's in good hands. Oh, thanks, Callum. If you want to learn more about Samri and the researchers working to build a brighter, healthier future for you and your family, head to samri.org.au.